Hello, my name is Anne-Marie France, and I am the department head of the Business Process Innovation Department at MITRE. In my role, I am accountable to integrate the capabilities of process engineering and business innovation with other capabilities where MITRE has expertise to provide solutions that solve problems for a safer world. People ask me about the scope of our mission, solving problems for a safer world. Well, a safer world extends beyond what may first come to mind, national safety in the context of defense. A safer world includes domains like health safety, judicial safety, educational safety, and economic safety. In each of these areas, innovation is critical. These innovations may come in the form of new technologies, products, services, or business models. At MITRE, we address each of these, and so can you. MITRE's public interest stance enables us to make strategic investments in untested solutions, research new concepts, and expand on existing ones. What we do at MITRE, you can do too. You can be bold and take risks where many cannot. Right now, you may be engaged in a design challenge where you will present your solutions to gaps that you see that no one else has addressed. Your ideas are new, your methods showcase your confidence, your solutions change lives. In the upcoming three modules, we hope to equip you with knowledge helpful to advance your solutions for impact. It is our hope that you insert your creativity and expertise into the fabric of innovations greatly needed today. So Julian, I hand it over to you to start us off with the first module. Take care. As Emery mentioned, my name is Julian Thiesfield and I'll be walking you through module one, preparing for presentations. Here at MITRE, I work as an operations lead in our Office of Inclusion, Diversity, and Social Innovation. My background also includes time in both startup and entrepreneurial spaces, and I'm incredibly passionate about helping my peers and colleagues give better presentations. Across the course of this training, you'll hear from a few of my MITRE colleagues, including Zaki Harris and Seth Lapierre, who will present Module 2, Pitching for Design Competitions, as well as Ash Asher, and again from Anne-Marie France, who will present module three, case studies and some additional resources. Let's dive right into it. All great presentations begin with preparation. The work we put in behind the scenes facilitates our ability to deliver our presentation in a genuine and compelling manner. For design challenges, this means your confidence and delivery make all the difference, and in the real world, investors and stakeholders are looking for deep confidence in the potential solutions they look after. For our first module, we'll cover the following areas. Foundations of presenting, flow, personal preparation, and review a couple additional resources. Up first, the foundations. First and foremost, we need to establish the ground rules for our presentation. A good general formula to follow is shown here. We'll want to begin with our time constraint. What do you need to accomplish across a given amount of time? Taking this info into account from the start will help you format the rest of your presentation. Next, understand the media assets you're permitted to leverage, as well as if there are any limits on their use. For instance, did the competition specify PowerPoint over Google Slides, or did they set a maximum number of slides? Delivery will also play a big role in how you prepare and execute your presentation. For example, a question and answer segment would likely go over much better in person than it would on a recorded presentation. Lastly, define your team's roles. Who's responsible for what? Who are your team's speakers? And who answers questions? When it comes to slide-driven presentations, a good rule of thumb is the 10-20-25 rule. 10 slides, under 20 minutes, 25 font size or higher. When in doubt, try to stick to half the number of slides as time. So if you've only got 10 minutes, five slides should do the trick. 
Let's take a look at an example. Oftentimes, we can get bogged down in the design and aesthetics of our slides. It's important to remember that the value of the presentation comes from the presenters. The slides are just supplemental. A good slide design will keep things simple, minimize text, and only use visuals when they truly enhance the narrative. Here, we have an example of a bad slide. It's pretty clear why it doesn't work, right? It's hard to see the text, the image is distracting and not supportive, and there are entirely too many words. How might we make it better? We can see we've made some great changes here. The image adds emphasis, but it doesn't distract the viewer. It's easy to read, and it focuses on the customer instead of the solution. Like we first mentioned, a slide should be designed to support the presenter's points, not to make them for them. Let's take a look at another example. In this case, we see a slide showcasing how not to present data on a presentation. The same errors are committed from the first example we looked at. There's far too much information and it becomes nearly impossible to tell the main point of the graph. Again, let's try to make it a little better. Here, we can see some clear differences. The slide now includes clearly titled legends, axes, and data, focuses on simplifying the data and presenting it in a cleared way, and it explains the data instead of using bulleted points next to the graph. Let's move forward onto the flow of our presentation. Presentation flow should generally follow the same format. No matter the audience, you'll always begin with a welcome and a clearly defined purpose. You'll introduce your team, provide context on the content if needed, dive into the story and content, and of course, remember to close with a thank you and time for questions. Preparation plays a big part in all facets of your presentation. A well-rehearsed script leveraged in the introduction of your presentation can start you off on the right foot and really set the tone for the rest of your presentation. Here's one possible approach. In your introduction, you'll want to ensure you describe who your customer is, outline their challenges and their needs, and then briefly move on to outline your solution and maybe even how it took shape. Here are some additional tips. Know your audience. Make sure that you're doing research on who will be in the crowd and tailor your presentation to them. Ensure that your language choices help you keep it simple. No research language or acronyms unless they're entirely necessary. You want the audience to be able to understand you in layman's terms. Context. Background information about your customer is necessary in that it helps you craft a compelling narrative and sell your story but it's important to keep it brief. You want the bulk of the narrative to be your solution. That means five to 10% of your time is spent on explaining the problem. And lastly, make sure you stay on point and stay on brand. Make your point and stick to it throughout the presentation. That means making sure that you're telling the same story to your audience, you're speaking in the same narrative voice, and you're constantly moving the plot forward. Personal preparation. Personal preparation always begins with attire. No matter the forum, proper attire is used to convey preparation as well as respect for your audience. While this doesn't mean you always have to go black tie, as the presenter, you should always be one step above the audience. When in doubt, business professional is your best option. And yes, that means even on Zoom. Let's take a look at a couple examples. What's the difference here? Hopefully you notice the same things I did. In the example on the left, we have poor posture, his hands are in his pockets, he generally looks unhappy. A presentation delivered like this would likely leave the investors and judges distracted by the body language and unsure of the presenter's ability to deliver. However, in the example on the right, we see a confident pose, 
the woman is smiling and making direct eye contact. And her confidence will instill greater surety in the audience and will allow her to deliver more powerful points. Giving a good delivery is simple. It really comes down to a couple key points. Make sure that you're comfortable and you're not fidgeting. People will notice. Use your hands when talking if it's natural. And of course, don't forget to smile. Effective speech centers around a few easy to remember concepts. Inflection, pace, and volume all help direct the emphasis of your presentation while helping you stay calm and in control. Lastly, make sure to enunciate your words. You want to make sure that you're speaking clearly throughout your presentation. Recorded presentations have their own specific set of considerations. With a recording, it's even more important that your audio and lighting are double checked, as well as your electronics. A great last point is to minimize the potential for accidents. Let roommates or others in your recording space know when you're going on and you're less likely to have an accidental featured guest. My colleague Ash kindly provided us a couple examples of lighting when recording at home. Here, you can see an example of poor lighting. And on the contrary, we'll see what good lighting in a recording looks like. It makes a significant difference to the audience, especially when viewing something that we've already taken the time to record. One of the last things we want to consider is body language. Make sure that you're conveying confidence and preparation in your presentation. You don't want to be slouched in your computer chair or in front of a crowd. One of the most important things you can do when conducting a recording is, of course, practice. A test presentation will help you ensure you've hit the mark on all of the areas we've discussed. As you work your way through these checks, audio, lighting, posture, Make notes on the areas that you want to focus on in the final recording. And lastly, make sure you have others review that recording with you. A second set of eyes can be a big help. Here's a couple last tips if you're working with a live audience. Remember to arrive early. The audience isn't just a static group, so you can use that early time to network and engage with the people who you'll be presenting with and improve your chances of making a meaningful connection. Also, remember to save time for Q&A. But with that said, it's important to remember it's always OK to say, that's an interesting question. I'll make sure to learn more about that. Last point is that you remember nerves are normal. Presenting can be a challenge, but with proper preparation, you can always do a great job. And of course, remember to have fun. We've included a couple additional resources and recommendations to further your knowledge on these topics. You can find them here. And of course, thank you. If you're interested in learning more about MITRE, please visit us at MITRE.org. And if you're interested in joining our team, MITRE.org backslash careers. Up next, we've got Zaki Harris taking over module two. Welcome to module two, pitching for design competitions. Following what you've learned in module one, in this module, we're going to go more in depth on the actual pitching in practice. My name is Guy Harris, and I'm a transformation engineer at MITRE. I've had experience with design challenges before through research challenges, as well as an Amazon Alexa hackathon design challenge. And I promise you that what you will learn here will help you with your pitches in the future. And for this module, I'll be presenting the first half, and my colleague Seth will guide you through the second portion. For this module, we'll go over these four major topics, understanding the guidelines, knowing your audience, how to tell your story, and some additional tips for success. In addition, we'll be using two case studies to help you see the skills you'll be learning through this module in real world examples. The first of those case studies is the 2021 Amy Design Challenge standing for Advancing Minorities' Interest in Engineering. The objective of the annual Amy Design Challenge, one of their premier events, 
is to first engage students in industry challenges and processes through collaboration with corporate business, government agencies, and technical leaders. And second, to introduce students to new and emerging technologies and how they're used to solve real life problems. And third, to provide the opportunity for innovative, out of the box thinking, skills development, and solution presentations. We'll also be using, as a case study, Sarah Alert, developed by a team at MITRE in partnership with national public health organizations. Sarah Alert is a standards based open source tool. Public health departments are using Sarah Alert to monitor individuals diagnosed with or at risk for COVID-19, as well as other infectious diseases, enabling real-time insights and increasing reporting capability for early containment of the virus. It allows public health resources to be directed where they're needed most. We'll begin here with how to understand guidelines given to you for the design competition that you're participating in. So what's the first step to understanding your guidelines? Well, first you'll want to understand the framework for the competition. For instance, who is evaluating you and what topic are you trying to tackle? And when is this all going to happen? And what should you expect in terms of evaluation? One good way to think about this framework is through the lens of the type of pitch you have to make. A competition pitch is very different than an investment pitch or a sales pitch. It's important to understand what type of pitch you're giving because the type of pitch determines what type of story you'll tell. And yes, pitching is like storytelling. It has a beginning, a build to a climax or the main point, as well as a conclusion. A story for a competition pitch may guide your storyline to share why your solution is the most innovative fit for a particular problem space. For an investment pitch, the storyline can position your solution as an opportunity that the audience wouldn't want to miss out on. And lastly, for a sales pitch, the storytelling would position your solution as one that directly aligns to the needs of your audience. Next, what will be the pitch format? Well, considering whether it will be in person or virtual, or if it'll be interactive with the audience or not, will help you understand how to communicate. For example, if the event is recorded, you will have to generate your own energy. And if it's live, you may have to manage your response to the audience's energy. Consider these points to help in structuring the very foundation of your pitch. Once the foundation for the pitch is set, how would you give it form? This is where the judging criteria, a defined set of standards for how submissions are assessed, comes into play. Usually, this is predetermined in advance and potentially released to the participating teams, so there could be a fair judging of the top entries. You'll want to do your due diligence and learn what those criteria are for your particular design competition. If you know the criteria in advance, you can make sure your pitch deck is relevant to each of the criteria and not spend time and efforts on things that aren't considered. For instance, if aesthetics isn't judged at all, you wouldn't want to spend precious time within your pitch going into the details of the look and style of your solution. Now, I'll go deeper into some common metrics that design competitions are judged on to determine winners among competing entries. This is very different than the investment space, where, for the most part, each potential investment is judged separately on its own merits and not in comparison to other startups. Now, let's see how we can utilize judging criteria for a pitch in practice. For this, we'll use the Amy Design Challenge as an example. For the 2021 Amy Design Challenge, we show on the left a quick synopsis on what the challenge is. In order to develop a solution to the challenge that also addresses each aspect of the judging rubric, you first have to understand what the categories are. The Amy Design Challenge judging criteria, shown on the right, is broken up into four main segments, desirability, feasibility, viability, and presentation. It is not enough to know the criteria category titles. You also have to understand how the words are defined for the specific challenge because some words mean different things to different people. By treating each aspect of the judging criteria as questions that need to be answered, you can explain your great solution to the judges in a way they'll understand. Let's start with desirability. 
this aspect considers if there is a market for your solution in the first place. Does anyone want your solution? In order for a solution to be desirable, it should be able to be adopted into everyday life somewhat easily. You'll want your solution to be communicated as both necessary and wanted. For feasibility, the question moves from, is your solution wanted or needed? To, is it even possible? Can we do this? For example, while it's welcome to push the limits of technology, it's important to balance that push with the current state of what is possible. Is the technology of today able to bring your solution to life? If not, do you have the resources to enable a technology that can? Be sure to take your time when considering feasibility and how you communicate that to the judges. Whereas feasibility determines what is realistic from technological, manufacturing, or delivery points of view, viability asks the question, can we sustain this? It's possible to have a very impressive technology, but without a business model that can support it, it won't see success. The addition of this viability criteria means the Amy Design Challenge judges will want to hear you talk about your fixed and variable costs and how you'll receive funds to meet or exceed those costs. Bottom line, how do you get the money to continue to operate? During your pitch, you'll want to talk to your business model from this lens and communicate to the judges how you'll keep your doors open long term. Lastly, there's presentation. Module 1 has already covered what it means to deliver a good presentation. Here is where you can put everything into practice by aligning what you've learned with your pitch. And in addition to what you've learned thus far, remember that you are your solution's first impression and how you present your solution will determine the impact it will have on the judges. Now, defining and understanding your audience is necessary to understanding the content they relate to and would be moved by. In many cases, your audience may be diverse, including everyone from judges to your friends and family. Narrowing your attention to the audience decision makers will help you tailor your materials to them, better delivering your content and convincing them that your solution is the winning one. Now, what's the first thing you think of when you put yourself in the shoes of these key individuals? You'll realize that people listen and see differently. And just for example, we'll explore two types of people who may be judging your pitch. First, an engineer. Maybe they have background knowledge or a specific area of expertise. They're math and science minded, so they connect more with data and facts. You may wish to present more graphs or charts with scientific references or connected to the latest research. Or a community member. Maybe they have deep ties into the community and are wondering how this solution will affect them personally. You may want to give case studies of how your solution might affect someone like them or connect your solution back to tangible impacts on the community. These audience members are going to have different mindsets that will affect the way they receive your pitch. You can increase your understanding of your audience, which is smaller than the entire audience listening to you, by building personas for the key members you're targeting. You could create high level categories to gather information similar to the five shown here. You could ask yourself, what type of background knowledge do they have? Or what types of stories might they be swayed by? And what are their general motivations? Now, these are only a few questions to consider when gaining knowledge of your audience. And throughout the process of doing so, be careful not to fall into the trap of thinking you know your audience better than you actually do. At times, people you know or people you care about could seem similar to the personas you created, but don't make broad assumptions and allow them to prevent you from confirming your audience understanding objectively. Now that we've discussed the value of understanding your audience, we'll use a case study to demonstrate this with an industry example. Recall Sarah Alert. It was developed by public health experts for public health. Consider an example of a pitch about Sarah Alert made to public health officials. I show here a mock-up of what a persona could look like for this audience demographic. 
By digging deeper to understand this persona better, we can understand both what they will care about as well as how they could benefit from Sarah Alert. In addition, as this mock-up highlights, this stakeholder has a higher level of expertise. Therefore, a more technical and detailed pitch may be welcomed. Now, imagine a pitch about Sarah Alert for a community association. This mock-up persona is quite different than the one for public health officials. If the association demographic includes people from multiple socioeconomic groups and cultures living in various dwelling types, then the question is how to present your solution to the whole audience. We can start to generalize things a bit more. Context is important, of course. Giving a more holistic view on Sarah Alert will likely be more effective here. That element of audience relatability will serve as one of the strongest points in your pitch in terms of how valuable the audience thinks your solution is. We have seen through the Sarah Alert case study that knowing your audience matters, but what do you do when you have multiple personas in a single audience? Well, through storytelling, you can control the flow of your presentation such that you address the interests of all groups. You may do that by packaging the key points to each persona separately or by weaving them together. Or you could pitch things generally, focusing on the common interests of all. In some challenges, you may have the opportunity to pitch to each audience separately. Your solution may be understood more effectively if pitched to an audience that has similar viewpoints and experiences after all. At this point, we've already gone over how to understand your guidelines and audience of judges, which help you form the context for your pitch. Now you're probably wondering, how do I use that information to tell my story? Well, I'm excited to introduce you to my colleague, Seth, who will guide you through the most effective way to use storytelling for a successful pitch. All right, thank you, Zaki. My name is Seth LaPierre, and I'm an innovation lead here at MITRE, and I'm excited to take you through the remainder of this module. All right, so now let's focus on telling your story. Let's bring it to life. There are many different ways to tell your story. In this context, we're gonna focus on five key components to that story. The first is welcoming introductions, the second is problem. What is it you're trying to solve? The third is solution. What is it or how is it that you are going to solve that problem? The fourth is the business model. How does your business operate and fit together? And the fifth is the wrap up. The thank you and, and what are those next steps? The rest of this module, we are going to go through each of these sections in a bit more detail. The first is introductions. If I were to introduce myself, I would say, hi, my name is Seth LaPierre. I'm a business innovation analyst lead at MITRE. I have 15 years of experience in entrepreneurship, management consulting, and marketing strategy. I hold three patents. I have a master's degree in strategic design and management, and I'm actively involved in several universities, and I love helping students explore rapid innovation and entrepreneurship. And on the side, I'm an avid 3D printer. Now, this is a great approach if you're a single team member. You can highlight your key experiences and expertise that relate to your problem. Let's take a look at a couple different options. The second is if you have a team and you want to introduce everyone individually. We do suggest that you have one person introduce each of the team members for continuity. You can highlight one or two bullet points from each of your team members. Don't read all of the bullet points, or you could call out what they focus on. This is a great way if you have a small team and you all have individual strong experiences. Let's take a third approach. A third approach is, you know, what if one of the team members has much more experience than someone else? You can present your team as a collective unit. This is a really great way to do that. Collectively, we have 45 years of experience across advancing corporate and federal objectives. We're experts in design thinking, identity, lean startup, et cetera. And we have a successful track record across technology implementation, commercialization, and social innovation. This type of approach gives a really strong unified presentation of who your team is. Each approach is great, and you really have to decide what's the right one for your team and for your context. Whichever approach you choose, you really want to focus on your relevant industry expertise. What are the degrees that map to your solution or your problem space? What is your startup experience? Do you have community experience that relates to your work? What awards have you had? So you really want to tell a strong story 
as to why you're the best to solve this problem. Now, let's look at the problem. How do you introduce the problem? Before you introduce it, you want to make sure that you've defined the problem. Who's the customer? What is the problem you believe that customer is having? And then finally, explain the impact on their lives. How is that problem impacting their lives? Is it a frustration in my day? Or is it a completely disrupt my whole life? So what's the scale of that problem you're solving? When you communicate the problem, you really want to tell a story, especially from the perspective of someone who faces it. You can bring this to life through a story from your customer's perspective or point of view. You can add in statistics, whether it's national or global, to help add some more foundational evidence for that problem. And you also could share some personal or community level impacts of that problem. So let's take a look at a case study for Sarah Alert and see how they introduced the problem. We're gonna hear from Dr. Paul Jaris, the chief medical advisor at MITRE, whose expertise is in the areas of driving major population health across health equity and policy initiatives that improve health and wellness at the state and national levels. So the problem for public health agencies is they have to respond quickly, they have to respond rapidly. Now, unlike a fire department that has uh, fire people waiting in the, um, in the fire station for the alarm to go off and then they respond, in public health, we have a grossly underfunded system where people are already stretched to do the work they have. There is no workforce waiting to respond. So they get pulled off child immunizations, they get pulled off the women, infant, children's programs where they're uh, helping um, with commodity foods for pregnant women. They get pulled out of STD clinics to respond. It's really tough. And there's no money to respond. The way this works in this country is that Congress has to have a special appropriation um, to, to fund an outbreak that often comes when the disease is already starting to wane and get better. Um, that's a huge stress on public health. So what does that mean? The first lines of defense to contain it by uh, finding people, quarantining them, tracking who they exposed, quarantining those people, has to be done with a very small workforce with no money to fund the response. Um, there have been some, there's another thing that's important about the congressional funding. It can only be used on that given outbreak. So that this is true with, with, with H1 or Zika, the money they appropriated could only be used on H1N1 or Zika, meaning you can't learn the lessons from those outbreaks and develop tools to prepare for the next outbreak. All the way back to SARS and around the turn of the century, we knew we needed a tool to track people in quarantine and isolation, but we couldn't build it because of the money. And that's where MITRE comes in. MITRE can build it for a number of reasons. Great, so this was one of the many effective and possible ways to introduce the problem. I invite you to consider what you liked about the introduction, apply a critical eye to presentations like this whenever you see them, and think about how they can help you advance the way you pitch your problem in your presentations. Solution, so after we just introduced the problem, now's a great time to introduce the solution. How are we gonna make that better? When you deliver your solution, you wanna focus on how it delivers value for your customers. And what is that unique gap that it's filling that no one else has been serving across the market? Data, data, data. Whenever you introduce a solution you have, you want something to back that up. And data is a very effective way to make a strong case. What could that look like? In this case, we spoke to 50 plus public health officials and we found that they need X, Y, and Z. Or we hosted five focus groups within our community and our insight was that this gap exists. That will help make your story more real. So we looked at data and that can help tell a strong story but you wanna bring your story together with visuals. What does that look like? You could map a day in the life of a customer. What are they interacting with? What's the flow of their emotions? You could demonstrate the user experience. What are the different pain points? What does it look and feel like for the user from the perspective of the audience? Or you could show a prototype, something movable, tangible. This is the product and this is what it does and this is what it looks like. Let's take another look at Sarah Alert and how they introduced their solution. So what we're trying to build, and I'll get back to how we build it, um, is really a flexible information technology to address the solution. How do we give public health a tool that is an enduring tool that they can use in any outbreak that comes down the line to rapidly respond, identify people, track them efficiently and effectively 
while they're in quarantine or isolation. Um, what we want to do is have a, a tool where public health enrolls those people. Those people then are given the option and uh, to report in numerous different ways to public health on a daily basis. So the public health can monitor them on an exception basis and doesn't have to chase down every individual every day, which is very resource intense. If the person has a symptom, public health is notified, responds, gets them into care in a way that's safe, i.e. they're not waiting in a waiting room, or they're not going into a hospital where the hospital isn't prepared for them. You may recall that the only gentleman in this country who developed, who came here with Ebola, went into a hospital and was sent home with a sinus infection and an antibiotic prescription. That's the type of thing we're trying to prevent by letting them know what's coming in. Uh, secondly, in addition to that rapid response to care for the individual, it gives us a tool to contain the spread, prevent it, slow it down so we have time to, to invent our uh, immunizations or come up with an antivirals. The other thing is we're building this in a way that is disease independent. So the next outbreak that comes along, or if this outbreak changes, we can modify this tracking tool with just some database changes. It doesn't take someone to come along and reprogram it, meaning a resource strapped public health community can rapidly respond with the appropriate tool. We also know, um, and with, I have great respect for our software engineers and our developers. Uh, they're amazing here at MITRE. I'm just in awe of what they do and how fast they do it. But the real problem is human beings <laughs> and working across our federated system uh, within the United States to assure that the, a good idea can be implemented. Okay, great. So see how Dr. Jaris brings it to life, shows the value of the solution. Who is it for? Who's the customer? How does it work? And his slide is clear. The audience members can follow along. There's bullet points, there's bold text. That's great. Now let's look at a visual story. How can you bring it to life visually? Here we have an example of a journey map. In the top left, we're telling the story of a member of the population who gets sick. Top left, they're sick, then they move through this journey all the way to the bottom left of they are well again. Each component on this journey is a element they interact with along that path. And it clearly shows all the different components and how they work together across that journey. And then where Sarah alert on the right side of that slide fits in. So this is great where it's a effective way to tell a story and bring the solution to life without actually building that technology. And now let's think about the business model. What is the business model? First, let's take a step back. You may have been introduced to the business model or business model canvas uh, before in other trainings, but at a high level, it's all the different key components of your business. Who are your customers? How are you getting your product to market? Where are you making your money? The revenue streams? But what we're gonna focus on are three different components here. The value proposition, that's what makes your product very special. It's the secret sauce in the market. And then the business costs and revenue streams. If you're pitching to investors, those may be the most important components to speak to. The business cost. How much is it going to cost to run, build, operate your business? Revenue streams, the bottom right. Where is the money and the funding coming to build and maintain your solution? And of course, the value prop. Why are people going to choose your solution over anyone else or any other option they have? So you really want to focus on those areas. As you think about your customers and your revenue, you want to consider the total addressable market. What does that mean? Basically, out of all the people out there, who's going to buy your product? In this example here, we have the big bubble, which is the worldwide electric vehicle market. Let's say in this context, it's $162 billion. The middle bubble is the value for the U.S. electric vehicle market at $94 billion. And then the smaller bubble is the serviceable and obtainable market. So we think we can get 34% of the uh, U.S. electric vehicle market, and that's about $32 billion. So that means that's how much of the pie we're going to get. And as you think about this addressable market, you want to develop some sort of financial modeling or, or tool to get a clear picture of what the potential health of your business would be. On the right, we have a kind of a decision tree of sorts where there's some key considerations or questions you want to think about. We're not going to go through each one of these on the slide right now, but hopefully you'll be able to reference back to the slide and think about these questions as you develop your financial model to get that projection of what the health of your business may be. Okay, so now let's take a final look at Sarah Alert and see 
a snapshot in time of their success in servicing their addressable market. On this slide, we see a map of the United States and the territories. And this is a snapshot of who they are reaching right now. The bottom left serving population of approximately 40 million. And on the right, you have a key. This is really clear. Okay, the green means live. The audience can understand that Sarah Alert is active across these different states and it's about 40 million people. So that's great. It's clear, tell the story. So to wrap it up, you wanna keep things simple and clear. Introduce yourself. Summarize who has the problem, who has the need. Reiterate why your solution is the best among all other options. And at the end, invite judges and the audience to ask questions and share their reactions. And that's it. And now we're just gonna share a few more tips for success. Fielding questions. Like any presentation, it's bound to happen. You're gonna have someone ask questions. So you wanna have a plan to handle that. The first is you wanna determine who will field those questions. Is one person from the team gonna answer them? Are they gonna allocate the responses to the other members of the team? Or are you gonna have a raise your hand approach? The second is repeat the question. You wanna make sure you understand what they're asking. And the third is you wanna have a prepared response for questions you do not know the answer to. What does that look like? You could say something around, we did not consider that, but we did consider this and shift the conversation somewhere where you did do exploration or some additional work. The second is, that is a great area for further investigation. That shows your energy and commitment to doing additional work. What you do not want to do, you do not want to say, I don't know, and leave it at that. That will not be good. So do not do that. Have a prepared response to the questions you don't know the answer to. And then the pitch deck. So you created this wonderful pitch deck to tell your, you know, introduce what the problem is, introduce your solution, why it's important, what your uh, business model looks like. You want to take a step back and make sure you have all those key slides. Are they clear? Do they help bring the story to life? Are they effective in telling that story? Some other potential slides, if you have a highly technical product, maybe you want a technical approach slide. If you have a product focused solution, maybe you want to have a product slide that focuses on what that product is, the design and so forth. And then one thing you want to keep in mind is try to leave one minute or so per slide. That'll keep the tempo and the energy of the presentation moving forward. And then of course, practice, practice, practice. Share your deck with your colleagues, your mentors, practice in front of family members, in front of the mirror, record yourself, ask friends for their feedback. You want to ask as many people as you can for feedback and their reactions as you're developing this pitch deck. It may be uncomfortable, it may be awkward, but that's great because sometimes growth is awkward and uncomfortable. And this, you'll get rid of all of that or get through all of those emotions and uncomfortableness up front and not when you're in the front of an audience of judges. So practice, practice, practice. And some additional resources we invite you to look at. MITRE has an innovation toolkit that's a series of tools that you can use to think differently about the problem space in which you're trying to solve for. We also recommend that you explore through your own research. Are there pitch competitions at your university? Do you have a university innovation center? Are there local innovation ecosystems in your community? Do they have demo days? Do they have entrepreneurial events? Go look and try to find these things and become involved in them. And then is there mentorship opportunities, whether it's at your university or employers? Can you get a mentor to help guide you through this process as well and beyond? All right, so thank you. That concludes module two. We really appreciate your time, energy, and focus in this presentation. We invite you to join module three with our colleagues Ash Asher and Anne-Marie France where they'll take you through some additional case studies and resources to help further bring this training series to life and hopefully better prepare you for your pitch and beyond. Um, if you have questions about MITRE, you can visit us at those two links below. And thank you again and wish you all the best. Thanks for the handoff, Seth. I'm excited to be sharing with you our final module, case studies and resources. This is the final module of the series, module three. And at this point, you've learned presentation skills, you've learned how to communicate your problem solution fit, and you've learned how to pitch entrepreneurial presentations. 
Now, my name is Ash Asher, Senior Business Innovation Engineer at MITRE, and for this module, I'll be focused on sharing with you a little bit more about what's next for entrepreneurs after they join a design competition, and we'll talk about what being an entrepreneur looks like in the real world. Towards the end of our discussion, Anne-Marie France, our department head who you met earlier, will pop back on to close out our learning, so let's get started. Our learning agenda for this module is fourfold. First, we're going to discuss the general stages of a startup. That means talking both about where you currently sit as someone who's participating in a design competition and subsequently diving deep into what success looks like as an entrepreneur. Then we'll take a step back to discuss how you can keep momentum if you're interested in moving forward with your startup idea. Finally, we'll close with some key resources that will be of use to you during this journey should you choose to make it. Let's get started with section one. What are the stages of a startup? When you enter a design challenge, most often you're responding to a challenge prompt that you're either new or somewhat familiar with. And throughout the process of this design challenge, you're using the resources provided to you to transition from the first level of research, hopefully the initial stage of any startup, into the problem to figure out what you can do to solve the issue. At this stage, you'll have done some initial market research. You've had conversations with customers, you'll have discussed with potential users, and completed some competition research to see what's already out there. That combined has enabled you to form a clear idea of the direction you want to head. However, you may not have had the time to validate if your solution at this point is a fit to the problem you intend to target. That sets you here right in the middle of idea formation and validation, steps two and three. If you're interested in moving forward with this or another idea, your next focus is to validate your business model through customer discovery and other methods. This process can help you find leads to engage early adopters of your product or service and help you build your customer base while understanding them better. This is also important information to share with investors of your product later along the line. With that progress, you'll be right on your way to stage four, solidifying your startup foundation and getting that early execution of sales. That means growing your customer base, building partnerships, and continuing to move into the right markets. Stage five, growth and market expansion. With time and effort, your goal is to grow the company big enough to exit and to have that major impact you're looking for. But what does the end goal even look like? What does exit mean? Do you leave the company forever, make your millions, and go live on a beach in Tahiti? And the true answer here is that every case is different. So now we're going to move to the next section to discuss a couple of examples of successful founders who have been very impactful in their communities and what that's looked like both for them and the people they're solving a problem for. Let's start with Marla Blow, founder and CEO of FS Card. Marla is a great example of an entrepreneur that started her company after spending many years in industry. Lowe founded FS Card in 2014 after observing the lack of options available to Americans with history of low credit scores. And this was when she was doing a three year stint at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Before that, she spent seven years as an executive at Capital One. But the solution she was looking to provide was an unsecured credit card with a $500 spending limit, and that really helped the customer base she was looking to target. And with that idea in mind, she raised $190 million from angel investors and venture capitalists and was able to reach over 100,000 customers this far, extending them a credit line of over $50 million collectively. Her company was recently bought out by Continental Finance and she exited the company for an undisclosed sum. She could have made millions of dollars from that, we don't even know, but the point is that she still works for companies like MasterCard and on several company boards to use her expertise to expand her social impact. And she did a phenomenal job helping the population she was interested in supporting through a fintech startup. The next example I want to share with you is one of a graduate student who took a small niche idea and grew it into a huge success. As a young student, Sanjeet Bunker Roy noticed that the communities around him had a strong dependence on outside sources, which made living in those communities unsustainable. 
First, as a young student, he started small by temporarily leasing an abandoned sanatorium for one rupee a month, and he transitioned that space into a craft bazaar for local workers. This spawned for him and his founders a whole series of other efforts focused on localizing training to support rural empowerment and community sustainability. He became world renowned for the great social impact he had in villages in India and was thus able to expand his efforts through a Clinton Global Service Award. And now with his hard work, the Barefoot College makes $3.6 million a year on average from bazaars, upcycling and artisans who combined with government grants have allowed his organization to help over 2 million people in over 93 countries. The potential impacts, as you've seen, of being an entrepreneur are huge, right? You could solve a real world problem for thousands of people. You may create transformative products or services that will change lives, and you have the capacity to make a profound social impact on your community. For you personally, that means making you potentially the foremost expert in your niche, and it can be career or life changing and give you the chance at great wealth and notoriety. So those are some of the reasons you might want to continue with this or another idea. But now that you've seen a couple of examples of what success might look like, you're still at the early stages. So let's take it back a step right now and discuss how to continue your momentum forward. Still sitting in between stages two and three, your next goal is to validate your business model. The process of getting to stage four, startup and early execution takes three components, continued learning, data gathering, and startup development. Let's go through each of them individually. First, during this time, you have to make sure you're continually learning about the entrepreneurial process. That takes many different forms, but you already have the resources available to you. Do not go it alone. You can take business courses at your university or join massively open online courses such as Khan Academy or EDX. You can join local three day boot camps or entrepreneurial workshops, and you should focus on attending entrepreneurial events, which can be at accelerators, incubators or co working spaces nearby you. You also have the chance to engage with small business development centers who have counselors available to help you form your organizations. And you should definitely join pitch competitions and demo days in your region or nationally to continue to shore up your pitching skills because eventually you're going to have to pitch to investors. So you'll want to make sure you're not rusty in that area either. You should also focus on gaining mentorship either through your university connections to industry or otherwise, and that's going to be critical to making sure you have the team members and advisors necessary to your success. You don't need to reinvent the wheel here. There's tons of experts who have done this process before and are totally willing to help you. During this time, you'll also have to validate your assumptions on your solution. That means diving deep into validating your product market fit, also known as your problem solution fit. And you can do that in a few different ways, the first of which is customer interviews or customer discovery. That means talking to the people who have the problem you're trying to solve and understanding it from their point of view. Is this a hair on fire issue for them? Is this something that they're looking to tackle right now? You really want to actually talk to them to understand where they're coming from and how you can fit your features to the value you're trying to provide to them. You'll also want to do some surveys to understand in aggregate what they're looking at and some market research to understand what your competitors are doing or what's currently being done to solve the problem. And through this process, you can also discover those early adopters we talked about, which means people who may buy your product the second it's released. You'll also want to do things like price testing to understand how much somebody will spend on your product and channels testing because if you know who your customer is, but you don't know how to get to them, you'll need to know those mechanisms, right? Do they respond better to Facebook ads or Instagram or do you have to go to mother's groups to reach them? How do you get to your customer once you have the solution? These are all important pieces of data that you'll need to be successful and to present to investors when you're looking to get funding for your product. This process is time consuming, but it is make or break for many teams, so we strongly encourage you to focus in this area. At the same time, you'll have to spend efforts on developing the startup itself. That means diving deep into product readiness. 
Can you transition your minimal viable product into a prototype you can show your investors and customers? Have you tested it effectively? Can you ensure that manufacturing isn't going to cost too much? Is your team ready? Do you know exactly what each person is doing and have defined your equity? Have you fully built your revenue model and tested it to have full-blown customers and then know how to keep your customers while also growing them? Have you had those deep partnership conversations? Can you gain access to new markets in an efficient way to accelerate both your growth and the growth of your partners and to help you to offload that non-strategic work? All of these are questions you'll wanna ask yourself and also work on as you develop your startup during this time. So who helps you on your way, right? This is a lot of work, but the good thing is you don't have to take this journey in the vacuum. So now we're going to highlight a few areas you may want to look into to help you move along your path to success as an entrepreneur. You're not doing this alone, remember? I'm highlighting here that at each stage of the startup, there are different funding and resource opportunities available to you. After or during the process of business model validation, one of the best places to get support is accelerators, incubators, mentorship programs, and grant programs. I've highlighted a couple you'll want to research here, especially in the initial component, the grants and prize money stage, right? That is where you're going to find a ton of resources before you have to give any type of equity out to an investor. So you'll want to do pitch competitions to make money. You'll want to look into your federal, state, and local resources and think about ways you can engage your friends and family for investment as well or for effort, right? The easiest way to get funding for your startup is to start small and bootstrap it because later on you're going to have qualified buyers or be looking at lending mechanisms or corporate or venture capital that will need a lot greater say in what you're doing. So feel free to engage the resources in your local community and do the research to understand who's available and already there. And you may want to talk to entrepreneurs who have been successful in your community to see the best places to go first. One of the examples I want to share with you is our very own MITRE Bridging Innovation Group. Bridging Innovation at MITRE is focused on building pathways to discover, accelerate, and deliver innovation from non-traditional sources to solve national problems. Many of the fastest moving technologies come from small, innovative startup companies and government agencies would like to access them. And many of those also come from academic and student-led teams like yourself. But the traditional government acquisition process is a challenge for both the agencies and the startups, and that's where Bridging Innovation comes in. Bridging Innovation's mission is focused on the five key pillars shown here, intended to create ways for our government sponsors to rapidly gain access to cutting edge solutions to real world problems. This framework runs the gamut of supporting innovation ecosystems across the nation. But what I would love to point out to you here is that since 2013, MITRE's Bridging Innovation team has become deeply involved with the innovation community, starting in Massachusetts and growing outward. And we're looking to expand that to even more universities in the coming years. A great example of how Bridging Innovation has supported university entrepreneurs in making an impact is through the case study of Python, a company our team met through Mass Robotics. Pison applies technologies to help individuals with amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, also known as Lou Gehrig's disease. We introduced them to a variety of federal missions and use cases for their technology and showed them how to apply for financing that didn't require the sale of their company shares. That way, they can still work on government use cases while retaining their focus on helping people with ALS. With our help, in addition to contracts with Google, Microsoft, and Bose, they've secured significant government contracts and are developing solutions for multiple federal agencies. In addition to directly partnering with startups and programs that support our mission, MITRE works with the startup ecosystem to support underrepresented founders. One such incubator that MITRE partners with today is Envision. Envision is another great example of a resource that might be of use to you as you continue your startup journey. Envision is a virtual accelerator for women and people of color who are currently in college, and that makes them a perfect fit for you if you're a student in a design challenge looking to move forward with your startup idea. Envision's goal is to foster an ecosystem of founders, investors, and operators that support diverse founders at the beginning of their entrepreneurial journeys. 
Much like other accelerators, their primary program is a 10 week cohort based approach to get you to the next stage of the business. That includes potential non dilutive grants of up to $10,000, hands on workshops, one on one mentorship, investment introductions, and a functional operational toolkit. And finally, here are some additional resources you can mine to help support you on your path to success. That includes our very own innovation toolkit, minor challenges that you might want to join if you're interested in finding another idea that's not the one in your current design competition, and focusing on engaging with your local university innovation center or technology commercialization office. You'll also want to look at local or national accelerators and incubators like I mentioned previously. And closing here, as you can tell, the process from research to startup, of course, takes time. One of the main timelines for startups is that year four is really when you get to success, similar to career progress, right? You need to get everything off the ground and it takes time to build that foundation. But you don't have to quit your day job. And that's the most important thing here. Many entrepreneurs like Marla Blow conduct the startup as their side hustle until it's making enough funding and has enough traction for them to transition over to full time. That means potentially finding success in your late 30s. But you have many options to be an entrepreneur, right? You can start with this idea and hit the ground running with all the resources you've already gotten to support you through your design competition. You can be an intrapreneur at your work, building out new innovations within your company. You can take the skills you've learned today and revisit them later when you have an idea you want to run with, right? There's tons of options here, but the time is your own. You get to choose when you want to be an entrepreneur and what path you wish to follow. Most importantly, from the modules we've presented here, you have the knowledge necessary to pitch your idea to accelerators, incubators, venture capitalists, investors, and other resources. Now you have to tailor your story, leveraging what we taught you. These skills are completely transferable to many aspects of your life, and we hope you can find ways to apply them there too. You already have the skills. We're so excited that you took the time to learn with us. Thank you for taking the time to listen to our modules on entrepreneurial presentations. Now I'm going to pass the microphone one last time to Anne Marie France to close us out. Thank you, Ash, Julian, Zaki, and Seth for sharing such rich information. I learned so much from each of your presentations. Through our three modules, our goal was to equip you with skills to present your solutions in such a compelling way that your audience will lean into your every word. We encouraged you to think big and consider how you can move forward with this solution or the next. These skills practiced now through design challenge competitions are translatable to any career path and will make you indispensable in the workforce as an entrepreneur or to your own company as an entrepreneur. Let's reflect back to the case study we presented, Sarah Alert. With the COVID-19 threat, MITRE is dedicating our energy and resources to finding a way forward. And in a matter of weeks, about the same amount of time you may have with a sponsored design challenge, MITRE created Sarah Alert to help public officials support individuals with COVID symptoms and contact tracing. We are confident that your ideas can have impact on the same scale too. At MITRE, solving problems for a safer world is our consistent design challenge prompt. We encourage you to keep generating customer focused solutions to challenges that present all around you. For all of us, the world is a safer place because MITRE exists. For all of us, the world is a brighter place because you are prepared to do what MITRE does, solve problems for a safer world. Be bold and thank you for joining us.